is the story of the Pacific and its people. Of the peaceful sea and the lands and lives it touches. And their meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company as a public service and dedicated to a fuller understanding of the vast Pacific Basin. This broadcast series comes to you as another feature of the NBC Inter-American University of the Air with drama of the past and present and commentary by Owen Lattimore, authority on the Pacific and director of the School of International Relations, Johns Hopkins University. The Islands of the Pacific. Japan stands astride the islands of the Southwest Pacific. Here, the United Nations are battering against the outer defenses of her island empire. Here, the Japanese have converted the larger islands into formidable fortresses and the smaller islands into fortified outposts. The islands which had so long been isolated have become a part of the global war and give promise of playing an increasingly important role in the Pacific era to come. So many islands dot the Pacific that their exact number is unknown. Guesses have been made that there are 30,000. First human inhabitants of the mid-Pacific islands were the Polynesians, the most daring deep-sea voyagers and explorers the world has ever known. The time has come, O oh High One. This is a Polynesian weatherman. The gentle winds are blowing up. From the southeast? Firm, strong winds from the southeast, O oh High One. Are the hurricanes past? Yes, the hurricanes are safely passed. So also are the variable winds of the summer. And now that autumn nears, the favorable winds from the southeast have come. We have waited long for them. The time has come to sail. The ship is ready, old high one, and well provisioned. We must have ample provisions, Captain. Food enough for 60. Enough for the voyage to the island over the horizon is already stowed aboard. You have food for the children and the women as well as for the men? As much as our great ship can carry, O High One. We must prepare for any fortune. The dried and cooked food prepared these many months while the ship was building have been wrapped in bundles and stowed. There is cooked breadfruit and sweet potatoes, dried fish and shellfish, green coconuts for both food and drink calabashes, and bamboo joints filled with water. That is good. And to stock the new island over the horizon, we have chickens and pigs and dogs, and these we can eat if our food runs out before we sight land. Then we will sail at dawn, pass the word, and see that the ship is ready and nothing is forgotten, so that we will... Throughout the night, the Polynesians prepared for their migration to the islands over the horizon. The captain, as the overseer, gave the ship a final inspection. The ship was a great double canoe, more than 100 feet long, joined by platforms and with deck houses built on top. Towering up from the canoes were masts with sails of plated pandanus fiber. And both canoes were equipped with paddles, bailers, and stone anchors. At dawn, without compass or charts, the Polynesians sailed into the open ocean. The clouds are descending upon us, O High One. Then we shall not have the stars to guide us tonight. Not tonight. It will be black. How long will these clouds lie upon us? We shall not see the stars through them tomorrow night, but perhaps we shall see them the night after. Captain, can we hold our course without the stars? We know the steady roll of the waves before the winds, O High One. By them we shall be guided. And when the clouds have cleared, the stars will again tell us our way. In two days, the clouds had lifted, and gleaming down on the Polynesian emigrants on the great expanse of the Pacific were the stars they knew so well. They sailed through the nights and days. 
Help me. Help oh. me pull in this fish. Oh, it must be a big one. He is struggling. Ah, here it comes into the boat. Get it. Get it. I have it. I have it. Oh, there. Ah, what a fat one. What a big one. Rain. Rain. We must be thankful. Catch all of it. We may have use for it. Help me here. Pour this water into this calabash. Ah, this is a gift. We must lose none of it. The days slipped away, and the experienced Polynesians sailed directly on their course. Each thing they saw had meaning to them. There, there, there is a piece of driftwood. Get it. Yes, sir. Stand clear while I throw this line. The driftwood told them they were nearing land. Every eye scanned the sky and the sea. That bird. See it? See that bird? Yes, yes, it is a plover. We have seen birds of that kind before. We cannot be far from land. Day and night they sailed. At night they studied the stars, which they had long since come to know. They knew the various constellations and their positions in the sky at different seasons. They knew the winds and the sea itself. Captain, over there on the horizon, you you see that? What is it? That that color on the clouds. That. That faint color. See it? The clouds are strangely different, yes. It is uh, green in color. Pale, pale green. A reflection? Yes, a reflection, Captain. I see it. I see it there, far, far away on the horizon. Yes, I see it now. That is land. Land hidden over the horizon. Land? You see yes. land? Yes, there, oh, I one. There, I see the green reflection on those low-lying clouds. Yes. Yes, I see. Land. That is our destination. From island to island, the Polynesians spread, establishing their own society and culture. To the north, they spread to Hawaii. In the east, to Easter Island. In the west, to New Zealand. Here, the white man found them. Many of the islands were found by Magellan, the first white man to cross the Pacific. Scores were were found by Captain Cook at the time of the American Revolution. American whalers put in for water and supplies, but still others. The Western nations came. Portugal, Spain, the Netherlands, France, Germany, the United States, Britain. And the islands of the Pacific were brought into the orbit of world politics. World conflict. At the time the United States was fighting its civil war over the issue of slavery... The same issue was taking form in the islands of the Pacific. Here is where we will establish our cotton plantation. This is Captain, the Honorable Robert Towns, a merchant of Sydney, Australia. We will call this plantation Townsville. Uh, this will be an excellent location, sir, here near Brisbane. Uh, but oh, ideal for growing cotton. I was not thinking of that, sir. Well, that's all that need concern us. As foreman, I must think of securing labor. Should be ample labor available, immigrants? The white man cannot stand to work here in tropical Australia, Captain Towns. Not plantation work at any rate. Well, you can use islanders. There are not enough of them here. Well, then we must get them. There are plenty of islanders available in the main. Ships were fitted out to make calls on the islands and to bring back workers for the plantations of Australia and the Fiji Islands. They dropped anchor off the islands and waited for the islanders to come out in boats. Look at them. Coming out in boats, Captain. There's a good lot of them, Mr. Gryson. Aye. And look at all those standing there on the beach watching us. We must give no sign that'll make them suspicious. I've warned every last man of the crew. Everything's ready. The hatches are open? All of them, sir. And the tins of biscuits are down in the holes in plain view. Make no false moves and be in no hurry. You understand, Mr. Gryson? I do, sir. I'll have a man near each hatch. I'll give you a signal and then be answer my it. Aye, sir. With any sort of luck, we should be... Well, That's one of the islanders in that closest boat. What did he say, sir? I couldn't make it out. He said something about shippy. Well, shippy he said, where's shippy come? I'll answer him. Missionary ship! Missionary ship! They understand. They know what you mean. Aye. They're coming up alongside in their boat. Give me a hand. Aye, sir. Below there! Aye, sir! Not the Jacob's letter over this side! Both of them! Aye, aye, 
That first boat. They're coming up over the side. Give my hand a walk out there. Come on, get on, Come on, up to your camp. Easy there. Easy. There's the first one coming aboard. You've warned the men to make them welcome. I say, good old. There's six, eight, nine boats coming alongside. Watch yourself. We want as many as we can get. They're coming up on deck. One after another. Aye. Come on, get on. Look, the men are instructed to make them feel at home. Ah, oh, they've spotted the open tins of biscuits down in the old. Aye, sir. That they are, sir. Are you going to get them singing hymns this time? May not be necessary this time. They've taken our word for it with a missionary ship. They keep right on coming. Aye. And they'll follow the others right down through the edges to the biscuits like a line of ants. I guess that's about all of them, sir. Just a few stragglers. Hey, those last two over there, they're stalling. They look suspicious. Yeah, they're not going down through the edge. They'll warn the others if they see anything. They're looking at us. Will we wait? No. Batten down the edges. Aye, aye, sir. Batten down the edges! Batten down the edges! Come on, come on, come on. Look out, sir. I'll fill that one with this for my You with him. <laughs> now you below there. Knock down that man that's trying to get over the side. I get him, sir. Yes, well. Hope those two men below. Mr. Grayson, up anchor and get underway at once. All right, sir. Stand by the question to our banker. Fourth watch your love. Give me every inch of canvas yet. Put the main screws under the cancels. Aye, aye, sir. All together, Maggie. Oh, 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 oh. The anchor's up. She's heading into the wind, sir. Come on, sir, you beggar. Come on. It's the islanders below deck, sir. You know what to do, Mr. Grison. That I do, sir, but it's likely to kill some of them. We can't have them screaming like this. Down as first, Mr. Fellow, let's have it. Aye, aye, sir. Here, you. Give me a hand down over the side. All right, ease him over the side, easy. All right, come Here. on, take it easy now. Take it easy. Oh, well, uh, all right, Mr. Fellow, let's have it. Aye, aye, sir. Aye, aye, Them, sir. But I'm afraid we've killed some of them shooting into the mass of them like that. Wait ten minutes. Then open the edges, drag out the dead ones and throw them overboard. We've no time to waste. We've got to get back to Australia. Blackbirding. The practice of kidnapping islanders and taking them to work on plantations continued for years. The slave traffic brought reprisals from many islanders who clubbed white men to death, ate them, and sent pieces to all the many villages. Murders and atrocities multiplied until the traffic was at last brought to a halt. Through this practice, the islanders came to know the white man. The white man had his day in the islands of the South Pacific until 1914, World War One. Then the shadow of Japan fell across them. The Japanese have seized the Caroline Islands, the Mariana Islands, the Gilbert Islands, and the Marshall Islands from Germany. The Japanese have already started occupation. In the high councils of the Allies, the next Japanese step came to light. Of course, uh, Japan came into the war against Germany through her treaty with Britain. That is true. But was it not understood? That Japan would limit itself to, uh, well, uh, certain naval action? That was the understanding, was it not? Yes. Chasing German submarines in the Pacific. And the purpose of that was to uh, 
Restricted areas of Japanese stay. But now Japan has seized the Carolina Islands, the Marianas, and the Marshalls. Uh, Japan has assured Britain that it has no territorial ambitions. Then why has Japan approached Moscow for assurances that Russia will support the claims for these islands at the peace table? Uh, Japan has asked Britain for the same assurances. And France. And Italy. It can only mean that Japan means to keep those islands. Japan has approached each of the allied nations. It is as if she were demanding these assurances as the price of remaining in the war against Germany. And that is precisely what she is demanding. While we are busy in Europe. Gentlemen, uh, this problem must be resolved at the peace table. We are engaged on the continent, and at this same time... We at are... the close of World War I, the League of Nations gave Japan only a mandate over the islands instead of out-and-out -out annexation. Japan was in honor bound not to fortify them. But years later... Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, uh, did you get the name of my paper? Come on, come on, don't stay on that phone all day. I'll go on, keep your shirt on, will you? I just... No, 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 I was talking to this guy behind me. Yeah, now look, here's the cable. Look, bud, this is the only phone available here. Step I love a mic, will you keep quiet? No, 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 now listen. Now, here's the cable. Never mind about saving words. Uh... Matsuoka has torpedoed the League of Nations. Matsuoka just walked out with the entire Japanese delegation. Everybody is stunned. The Japanese made it clear that even though they are holding those South Pacific Islands under a League of Nations mandate, if the League should try to withdraw the mandate, that Japan will hold the islands by force. Get that? Yeah. Yeah, and send that cable out fast you can. Don't spare the horse. Throughout the world, political observers were alive to the meaning of this Japanese coup. You know what it amounts to. Japan's defying the League of Nations. She's defying the world. The League took the hint and didn't even discuss the possibility of withdrawal. Well, what could it do? Well, it did this much. It didn't commit itself to the idea that it could not withdraw the mandate. That just means that the question is still wide open and that it will crop up later. The only way anybody's ever going to get those islands away from Japan is to take them away. Why do you say that? What do you think Japan has been doing in those islands all these years since World War I? She doesn't permit anybody to go there... While the seeds see. of World War II were ripening, the islands of Micronesia were being transformed into as much a part of the Japanese Empire as Yokohama or Kyoto. For years, even while Japan was ostensibly at peace with the world... Travelers who tried to secure visas. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to get a visa to visit the Caroline Islands. Oh, so sorry. Uh, no visa for the Caroline Islands are available. Well, I'm a, I'm a sort of a world traveler, a globetrotter, and I like to get down uh, there. I understand, but it is impossible. So sorry. <laughs> Japan closed the door of these islands to the world. But some information about them did leak out. Truk is perhaps the biggest naval base in the Pacific outside of Pearl Harbor. It's in the Caroline Islands, and it's a natural naval base if there ever was one. It is surrounded by high, rocky islands, and it has a lagoon 40 miles wide. Here at Truk, the Japanese have built naval installations. Kanapi is the largest of the islands. It is 410 miles east of Truk. It has a protected anchorage below a cliff 900 feet high. In this anchorage, American whalers used to put in for water from the streams and the valleys. And around this anchorage, on the north side of the island, the Japanese have built their naval installations. Japan has fortified an entire line of islands. The Japanese call this line their lifeline to the south. By this, they mean the defense of Asia. And behind this line and the islands to the north, the Japanese plan to build their empire into the greatest power on Earth. Japan had so well entrenched herself behind this, her great wall, that in September 1941, less than three months before Pearl Harbor... We are acting only in self-defense. This is Japanese Rear Admiral Sosa. You Americans are strengthening your strategic positions in the Pacific to blockade Japan's seaborne trade and eventually to throttle Japan. What positions do you refer to, Admiral Sosa? Hawaii, Dutch Harbor, Guam, and the others. But it will make no difference. You don't think the United States is going to attack Japan? Japan 
is now defended solidly along 4,000 nautical miles by various strategic systems which would be extremely costly to break through. Well, then Japan has fortified the islands of Micronesia. You have advanced bases in Pearl Harbor, Manila, and Singapore. That's true. But in case of an emergency, all of your advanced bases would be deprived of their value before reinforcements could be sent. If, in spite of this, reinforcements should be sent by land or sea, the Japanese army or navy would only have to lie in wait to destroy them as they come. Yes, but Admiral Sosa, all this is on the assumption that Japan and America must go to war. No matter what route the American navy may choose, the strategic position of Japan and our work of defense scattered all over the seas of East Asia enabled our empire to defend or attack in any direction. islands of the Pacific, the untold thousands of islands so long isolated from the world have become a part of the global war. The thousands of islands have become fortresses of steel and promise to be stepping stones to the greater era in the Pacific that lies ahead. The importance of these numberless islands to the war effort is daily becoming more apparent. And here to discuss their significance to us is Owen Lattimore, authority on the Pacific and director of the School of International Relations, Johns Hopkins University, Mr. Lattimore. Up to now, we have been talking in the Pacific story about the lands around the Pacific, the great countries with many millions of people. Today, we are concerned with the islands far out in the Pacific itself, not the big islands and island groups like the Philippines and Netherlands, India, and Hawaii, but the thousands of little and tiny islands that are scattered across the widest waters of the vast Pacific. These islands have never been very real to Americans. Few people now remember what Robert Louis Stevenson wrote about the South Sea Islands. A generation ago, Jack London used them as the setting for some of his most romantic tales of adventure about explorers and plantation owners and mutinous plantation laborers captured from savage head-hunting tribes. Martin and Oza Johnson, before they became famous for their films about big game hunting in Africa, made some of their early travel thrillers down in the islands. But all that seems very far away and unreal and different from the Pacific Islands in which young Americans, from your hometown and mine, are fighting and dying. Not for adventure and romance, but as part of the most terrible war in history, which is reaching into every home in America. What are American soldiers and sailors and Marines finding down there, besides war and Japs and malaria and dysentery? What are the little Pacific Islands like and the peoples of the, Pacific, of the islands? These islands have been part of the great gamble of empire building and power politics ever since the 18th century, when America consisted of 13 colonies along the Atlantic coast. But they were never the blue chips that were pushed out on the table when the big bets were laid. They were just not big enough in terms of land or people or resources. In most of them, there were not enough people to provide labor on a large scale. In many of them, the people fought savagely to escape being forced to labor on plantations. Consequently, the islands have largely been left to the enterprise of individuals from the civilized countries without much planned development by the governments of the great powers. An island or an island group for which one country would hesitate to fight another, could often provide good money-making opportunities for individuals or corporations. It only needed a handful of managers and overseers in charge of unskilled native labor to produce thousands of tons of coconut oil from plantations on hundreds of little islands that nobody ever heard of. We are proud of our superior civilization, but on the whole, the record of our civilization in the Pacific Islands is something to make us pause and consider our responsibilities as well as our achievements. The white man's burden was once a romantic phrase, but there is an ugly side to it. The white man has often himself been a burden on the shoulders of the people he has conquered and exploited. 
In large measure, this was due to the heedless and lusty way in which men made use of new instruments of power, like cannon and steam-driven vessels. When new lands and islands were discovered, and new peoples who had no power to resist, the discoverers thought first of how much they could grab and get away with, how they could get rich quick. It reminds you of the ancient gag about the Pilgrim Fathers landing and discovering the Indians in North America. They first fell on their knees and then on the Aborigines. Even religious and God-fearing men had standards for the behavior of civilized men toward other civilized men, but much lower standards for behavior toward uncivilized men. It was a long time before we began to have what you might call a collective conscience about the consequences of our actions and the responsibilities of civilized men collectively toward uncivilized societies collectively. For a long time, the peoples of the South Seas were fair game for anyone who had the power to seize and to hold. No one had, and no one in those days could, expect, could be expected to have, a sense of social responsibility. Take, for example, the diseases which the white men brought to the Pacific. Many people still act as though good health or disease were nothing more than the good luck or bad luck of the individual. The social idea of health control is quite recent. A lot of diseases that we think quite unimportant, like measles or the common cold, have been deadly scourges in the Pacific Islands because they never existed before the white man came and the people had no resistance. Take just one example. According to the Smithsonian Institution, as late as 1875, an epidemic of measles killed 40,000 people in Fiji, 40% of the population. We are now on the threshold of a new time. No one can soberly doubt that Chiang Kai-shek of China spoke for the conscience of the world when he said that after the war, the world must have a single standard of freedom. Some people are still not civilized enough to have full freedom, but that only puts the challenge up to us. We cannot legalize a permanent double standard of freedom and servitude. The problem is to raise the standard of those who are not free until they can undertake take the responsibilities of freedom. America accomplished this in the Philippines. More recently, the Russians have accomplished it in the Arctic and in Central Asia, where in one generation, primitive and semi-primitive peoples have been made literate civilized, modern. That is our real problem for the future. Islands in the wide Pacific can be important as bases for air routes, but in the long run, they are even more important as a test of whether man can make the world fit for mankind. To give a pint of milk a day to every Hottentot would be no solution for anybody's problems. The solution is to enable the Hottentot and the Solomon Islander to reach a standard of his own and for himself that includes health, education, progress, and eventually freedom. Thank you, Mr. Lattimore. You have just heard the 10th program of the new series, The Pacific Story. Next week at this same time, over most of these stations, the 11th will be broadcast. World War I in the Pacific, with drama of the past and present and commentary by Owen Lattimore, authority on the Pacific and director of the School of International Relations, Johns Hopkins University. You may secure an illuminating handbook of The Pacific Story with background information on each program in this series with suggested further reading. This specific story manual will be sent to you for 25 cents in coin to cover cost of printing and mailing. Address the University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Markwood. The musical score is composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. This program has been presented as a public service and another feature of the Inter-American University of the Air by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This is the National Broadcasting Company.